Good morning to all from Florida International University in Miami. I'm Luis Guillermo Solis, the interim director of the Kimberly Green Latin American Caribbean Center and former president of the Republic of Costa Rica. I welcome you to this symposium, which we started yesterday on taking care of our common home, a call that was made by Pope Francis five years ago and that has been ongoing quest of humanity since then. We have been talking about the need to introduce the ecology as part of a broader picture on the world and our responsibilities with it. Today, we have a very exciting program and I will be developing that further. But uh, not to delay this conversation, allow me to introduce for the presentation of our first speaker today, the president, the fifth president of the Florida International University, Dr. Mark Rosenberg. Mr. President, thank you for joining us and you have the floor, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, welcome everyone, I'm Mark Rosenberg. I have the privilege of being the president of Florida International University in Miami. And on behalf of everyone at our FIU, as well as FIU Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs and sponsoring organizations, it is my honor to welcome you to this very important dialogue. I also want to recognize FIU's Kimberly Green Latin American and Caribbean Center, our Department of Religious and the School of International and Public Affairs for organizing and supporting today's conversation. This year, we're celebrating five years since the publication of the papal encyclical La Lato Si on the care of our common home. A year ago, the bishops of Latin America celebrated the Amazon Synod, another landmark in the development of the Roman Catholic doctrine on our environment. So this conference commemorates these and other significant events taking place under the aegis of very diverse religious communities, highlighting the importance of protecting our natural patrimony. You see, we live in times of greater ecological awareness and in the face of extreme environmental challenges. And our FIU has been at the forefront of these issues in South Florida and the greater Caribbean. We see ourselves as a, as a solution center for our hemisphere. And we wanna acknowledge the importance of the environment to different faith communities. We also recognize the significance of ecological conversion as a personal decision to accept the individual responsibility to participate in the caring of our mother earth. At our university, we believe it's important to take responsibility for our patrimony. And that in part is what this program is all about. Yet this obligation is not only religious, uh, in a spiritual sense. It's also of the utmost importance from a public policy perspective. As societies and as, as engaged citizens who elect representatives to different level of government, we're also responsible for ensuring that the environment remains a high priority in our public agendas. This is true in a global sense, but it also becomes an issue of life and death in vulnerable areas of our globe, where climate change, extreme events, and other disasters associated with the mishandling of the environment, such as migrations in many instances, are creating dire conditions of survival for hundreds of millions of peoples. South Florida and the greater Caribbean are amongst these highly vulnerable areas. And in case you hadn't noticed, you will see that whether it's on the west coast of the United States or here on the east coast of the United States, there are significant environmental challenges even uh, as we speak. Today, uh, we've gathered a unique group of spiritual, academic, political, and community leaders for this conference. Their presence in the different panels attest to the complex nature of the issues that confront us. The issues ultimately are multidisciplinary in nature and have to be understood in that sense. So I'm grateful and I wanna thank those panelists 
for their willingness to participate and for the many outstanding contributions our panelists have made to ensure better lives al already uh, for many around the world. I'm especially honored to recognize a longstanding friend and distinguished Latin American figure who will be today's featured speaker, uh, Mr. Enrique Iglesias. As former Minister of Foreign Affairs of his native uh, country, Uruguay, and as former president of the Inter-American Development Bank, former secretary of the Ibero-American community, Mr. Iglesias is one of the most renowned political leaders, one of the most respected political leaders of the Western Hemisphere and beyond. He's a man of vision. He's been at the forefront of Latin American and Caribbean development for decades. And he continues to be a valued advisor and philanthropist whose efforts to improve lives uh, of the elderly, among, among others, is an inspiration for so many uh, of us. Last year, Mr. Iglesias was appointed special envoy to the, of the European community for Venezuela and remains personally engaged in the promotion of environmental issues uh, around the world. Uh, Don Enrique, we are grateful for your uh, participation in our conference. So I wish you all success throughout the next few days. The life of the mind is going to be enriched, not just spiritually, but humanistically with the conversations that we're gonna have today. We know your deliberations are gonna be fruitful and enriching. We're very proud to be a part of this very important conversation. And we're also looking forward to the action that will come out of what you learn and what you resolve as a consequence of these deliberations. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you, thank you very much, President Rosenberg, for your thoughtful remarks. Before I give the floor to our guest speaker, Don Enrique Iglesias, I would like to uh, remind you that we are translating the sessions into English, Spanish, and Portuguese, depending on which one you choose. Uh, for technical reasons, uh, I would like to tell you that those who want to hear Dr. Iglesias' presentation in English should click on the Spanish channel. We apologize for, for this little uh, technical issue. Okay, so those of you who want to speak the presentation in English, Dr. Iglesias will be speaking in Spanish, please go to your English channel. Without further delay, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Enrique Iglesias, other than his being a, uh, one of the foremost leaders in the Western Hemisphere uh, for his ideas and for his many contribution. He's an elder statesman. He's one of those few who have the vision and has had the capacity to articulate it into public policy and particularly in uh, convincing and inspiring of the need for a world based on peace, fraternity, and unity. I uh, now give the floor to Dr. Enrique Iglesias, whom I'd like to call warmly my very dear friend. Dr. Enrique, please go ahead. You have the floor. Gracias. Se oye? Si, señor. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, for your very, very stimulating words. Congratulations to the university for this initiative, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me Y gracias, Luis, por esta, esta aproximación a, a la universidad, cosa que me, me agrada muy especialmente. Yo quiero comenzar por decirles que yo no soy un científico, tampoco soy un filósofo, soy un practicante de la economía a lo largo de toda mi vida. Lo he hecho en mi país, en el Uruguay, eh, y lo he hecho también en oportunidades que he tenido pasar varios años eh, trabajando en las Naciones Unidas, en la comunidad iberoamericana y en algunas otras actividades en el mundo internacional. Por eso que mi, mi, mi mensaje hoy es, es más que nada un mensaje de una experiencia personal en el tema que me tocó, voy a mencionarles cuándo y cómo, y porque creo que estamos enfrentados a un desafío de una inmensa magnitud. Por eso me parece que esta aproximación 
donde aparecen las posiciones científicas, pero se convoca también a la ética y a las visiones religiosas sobre estos problemas, creo que responden a la magnitud que tiene el problema cuando lo ponemos en la perspectiva de largo plazo, que es lo que corresponde conversar hoy. Eh, yo de, quiero decir que me tocó, me tocó vivir un poco estos últimos 60 o 70 años en el mundo y ver y apreciar hoy la inmensa magnitud de lo que se ha hecho y la inmensa magnitud de lo que falta por hacer. Por de pronto creo que estamos al fin de una época. Creo que se está cerrando esa magnífica época de los últimos 75 años que sucedieron al fin de la Segunda Guerra Mundial y que fueron, a mi modo de ver, los años más ricos en contribuciones a lo económico, a lo social, a lo político de la historia de la humanidad. Y creo que eso sería fácil comprobarlo con estadísticas, pero basta decir que se ha creado un mundo que eran 50 países, son 193, se han hecho conquistas muy importantes en los avances de la democracia, de los derechos humanos, de la economía, pero también han quedado atrás graves problemas, los de siempre, los de las razas, las religiones y los nacionalismos. Pero en conjunto, el mundo de hoy es un mundo mucho mejor el que partió del año 1945. Pero fueron quedando grandes deudas frente al futuro de la humanidad y yo creo que es precisamente para hablar de una de esas deudas que está empezándose a pagar, es a que quería referirme hoy. Y lo hago volviendo un poco atrás, cuando, ¿cómo, cómo es que estos temas del clima, los temas del medio ambiente, la preservación, eh, cómo se han ido alimentando a través del tiempo. Yo recuerdo en el año 1969 eh, se produjo una toma de conciencia por el mundo por primera vez en forma colectiva de había que ocuparse del medio ambiente. 1969 se convoca a la primera conferencia mundial sobre temas ambientales que tuvo lugar el 6 de junio de 1972. Eso lo pondría como el inicio del despertar de la conciencia internacional. Allí hay un tema. Yo trabajé en, ese, en esa conferencia, fui, era funcionario a cargo de los países en vías de desarrollo. Y vean ustedes que en el punto de partida, las grandes oposiciones venían de los países en desarrollo los grandes países en América Latina, en África, en Asia, se oponían al tema, porque decían que esto se trataba de una trampa de los ricos, de los países ricos, que después de haber destruido todos los bosques de Europa, querían que nosotros detuviéramos el uso de los recursos naturales que habían sido puestos en duda por parte del Club de Roma, que hablaba del agotamiento de los recursos naturales. Costó mucho convencerlos y lo hicimos a partir de, una, de un diálogo, un diálogo como este, donde aparte de estar los políticos de un lado y de otro, aparecieron los científicos, aparecieron los sociólogos y pudimos de alguna manera tomar conciencia de que había que ocuparse del tema del medio ambiente, pero vinculándolo al tema de la pobreza. Así partió el nacimiento de este tema una reunión famosa de FUNE, allá en el año 71, de especialistas, que abrió la puerta a que los países pusieran de acuerdo en sentarse para hablar del tema y aprobar una resolución sobre el medio ambiente. Ahí, ahí partió un, una, una estupenda iniciativa que empezó a progresar en el mundo. Eh, ahí vinieron las conferencias del agua, las conferencias de la desertificación, los problemas de la vida en las ciudades, y el problema de la energía, los años 70 fueron tremendos, marcados por el aumento de los precios del petróleo. Debido a eso y con este clima que había partido de la Conferencia del Medio Ambiente, se convoca por primera vez también en la historia de la humanidad una reunión de la que fui secretario general en el año 1900, 
81 en Nairobi, para ocuparnos de las energías renovables. Primer momento en que este tema adquiere estatus de, de, de tema internacional. Se discutieron 14 fuentes de energía renovable. Se había excluido la energía atómica y la energía del petróleo, de los, de, de, de los, de, del petróleo y los derivados. Yo creo que sobre todo esto ha habido, es importante cómo el tema costó penetrar. Pasaron miles de años para que esto realmente adquiriera conciencia. Se han agrandado, digamos, en el tiempo algunas reflexiones de las grandes comunidades primarias, primarias de nuestro continente, por ejemplo, América Latina. Las comunidades indígenas respetaron siempre la tierra hasta el punto de hacerla una deidad. Pero creo que de alguna forma... Esta, 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 esta vinculación con el tema y la toma de conciencia, hay que reconocer que las Naciones Unidas han hecho un esfuerzo extraordinario que hay que reconocerles y de alguna forma apoyarlos y continuarlos. A mí me llamó mucho la atención, muy favorablemente, ver que las comunidades religiosas de varias denominaciones se están ocupando del tema, pero muy particularmente... Debo reconocer que la laudato sí ha sido, a mi modo de ver, una gran contribución del Papa Francisco por cuanto ha traído al debate la discusión del tema y de alguna forma ha puesto el acento en la necesidad de reconocer que la, para quienes creen o creemos en la existencia del Creador que ha habido un gran pacto entre el Creador y el hombre y la mujer en la tierra que es darle los medios para sobrevivir de la naturaleza, pero convivir con la naturaleza, protegerla y preservarla. Yo creo que ese gran mensaje que está en esta encíclica y que demuestra que se ha puesto en marcha no solamente las convicciones religiosas, sino también las tradiciones judeocristianas, los mensajes de la Biblia, en fin, todo eso está incorporado. Pero más allá de todo, lo que a mí me impresionó es primero esta visión desde lo espiritual, al gran acuerdo de la, de la creación y la invitación a que la única forma de enfrentarlo era colectivamente a partir de grandes pactos que pudieran de alguna manera tomar conciencia de lo que se estaba haciendo en la destrucción del medio ambiente y poner en marcha mecanismos solidarios para hacerle frente tanto a nivel del mundo en su conjunto como a nivel de cada una de nuestras nacionalidades, de nuestros países. De manera que yo pongo esto arriba de la mesa porque me parece que es bueno recordar cómo el tema surge en este momento con una gran fuerza impulsado por estos movimientos de la sociedad, pero fundamentalmente además el apoyo que están haciendo las corrientes filosóficas y religiosas que tienen mucho que decir y tienen mucho que aportar a este debate. Yo les voy a comentar el tema a partir hacer alguna reflexión para bajarlo un poco a la tierra, a los problemas en América Latina. Que yo creo que es un tema que vale la pena que nos pongamos a reflexionar con los datos, pocos datos arriba de la mesa. En este momento, como ustedes saben, en América Latina se presenta con condiciones francamente excepcionales en cuanto a las bendiciones que ha recibido de la creación en, este, en, la, en la historia de la humanidad. En primer lugar, hoy por hoy, América Latina produce el 13% de la producción agropecuaria mundial de alimentos. Supera individualmente a Estados Unidos, a Canadá, a la Unión Europea. Es la mitad de China, pero China no exporta, sino que importa alimentos. De manera que hoy por hoy, América Latina está convertida en la mayor exportadora del mundo de productos alimenticios. En segundo lugar, tiene un papel fundamental porque tiene la mayor cantidad de CO2 mantenida en los bosques naturales en a nivel mundial. Hoy por hoy, en América Latina, el 36% del estoque de carbono de la biomasa de los bosques del mundo está en la región. Es decir, de alguna forma, hoy... América Latina, que tiene el 8% de la población mundial, crea el 36%, tiene el 36 del de carbono en la biomasa en los, en los bosques del mundo. En materia de bosques, además, hoy el 20, 23% de los bosques del mundo 
están eh, en América Latina. Si vamos al ciclo del agua, esa, ese recurso tan rico para la sobrevivencia del hombre y de las especies en el planeta, América Latina aparece con una disponibilidad realmente excepcional. Más de un tercio del total de mundial del agua está en el suelo y en el subsuelo de América Latina. Nosotros en el Uruguay, junto con Brasil, Paraguay y Argentina, disponemos de un verdadero mar de agua, agua dulce bajo los suelos de, de nuestros países. Es decir, que en esta materia América Latina ha recibido los dones de la mente de la creación en forma espectacular. Y también pensando que el agua, como todos sabemos, no solamente es la fuente de la vida, sino que la fuente tío, también de los grandes conflictos que ha vivido la humanidad por su búsqueda y su disponibilidad. De manera que, y por último, el otro tema, mencioné alimentos, mencioné el tema de los, de la, los bosques para la, el clima, le menciono el tema del agua, le menciono el tema de la biodiversidad, la biodiversidad animal y vegetal. El Brasil es el primer país del mundo en biodiversidad y de los 10 primeros países del mundo, 6 están en América Latina. Es decir, todo esto ciertamente es para mostrar la magnitud de la responsabilidad que tiene la región así a su, a su propio desarrollo interno, pero también como parte importante del planeta en estas dimensiones que tan, son tan fundamentales para llevar adelante eh, la vida en ese planeta y preservarlo para las futuras generaciones. Yo quisiera decir ahora cómo nos movemos frente a este tema, qué está ocurriendo. Bueno, está ocurriendo en primer lugar que aparte de esta conciencia internacional hay que mostrar los factores que están impulsando este tema en el debate internacional. Las demandas de la opinión pública es, son realmente crecientes en esta forma especialmente porque esa, esa opinión pública es consciente de los impactos que está creando en la forma de vida, en, lo, en las relaciones humanas y que eso conviene fundamentalmente aportándolo a partir de los sectores más desprivilegiados. Los grandes problemas de la contaminación, decíamos en aquel informe inicial donde partió Naciones Unidas, están radicados en la pobreza. La pobreza misma es un factor que de alguna manera se constituye en agresor de la, del medio ambiente para la sobrevivencia. Y es este un factor que hay que considerar especialmente porque hay que vincular esta lucha a la lucha de la lucha contra la pobreza en el mundo. Es importante, por tanto, destacar que la opinión pública comienza a sentirse preocupada por la contaminación en las ciudades. Lo hemos visto en algunos países, lo estamos viendo eh, en, 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 lo vimos en China, lo hemos visto en Brasil, lo hemos visto en partes de Europa. Realmente la, 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 hay una, una presión creciente de la opinión pública por entender que el medio ambiente es parte de la calidad de vida y que por tanto... Y, parte de la vida misma y por tanto hay que tomarlo como en su consideración. A mí me impresiona mucho, les debo decir, en este debate, el ingreso de las jóvenes generaciones. Es muy espectacular, realmente, y, y muy particular, yo diría, muy emocionante el ver a la gente joven hoy asumiendo las responsabilidades de movilizar a la opinión pública, movilizar a los sectores políticos en el tema y a partir de eso generar movimientos políticos que hoy son movimientos muy importantes. Vean ustedes en algunos países de Europa lo que significan los verdes en el debate político y en la participación política. Es decir que el tema está adquiriendo cuerpo a partir de esta, esta presencia de la gente joven, consciente del problema e impulsor de las grandes corrientes de opinión que se transforman posteriormente en factores de carácter político. Yo creo que no, yo mencionaría cómo también todo este tema trasciende a las órdenes religiosas. Los obispos eh, católicos son miembros y se están ocupando de la Amazonía. El diálogo de obispos hoy se ocupa del tema de la Amazonía. Quiere decir que de alguna forma eh, el, el mundo que estuvo en silencio en su capacidad de organización durante siglos comienza a tener una presencia política 
en el debate, que yo creo que es de una enorme importancia y a la cual hay que asignarle ciertamente un papel fundamental en la toma de conciencia y por tanto en la adopción de soluciones. Entonces, todo esto se, tras, se, traspasa, se traslada luego al tema de la participación de la comunidad internacional. Yo creo que en estos últimos años hemos visto momentos muy importantes eh, en, en cuanto a la cumbre del milenio, por ejemplo, de lo, las metas para el año 30, incorporan internamente metas muy específicas respecto al tema del de el, el, el respeto por el medio ambiente y las transformaciones en el campo de la energía. De, de. La cumbre del cambio climático para mí ha sido una nota realmente histórica. Si yo pongo el 1972 como el punto de partida, diría que el 2015 es otro de los grandes picos en la historia de la humanidad, al ponerse de acuerdo por primera vez la humanidad, casi toda, desgraciadamente, no toda, pero casi toda, ponerse en, en, en de acuerdo para lograr el control del de calentamiento del planeta con medidas importantes que se van a proyectar en los próximos años en forma creciente. Yo creo que todo eso de, termina con otro tema, que también quiero dejar constancia en, la, en los movimientos de la sociedad internacional, que es la incidencia del problema del clima en el comercio internacional. Y esto constituye una forma de poder muy importante, por tanto, el comercio internacional del futuro va a tener que hacerse cargo inevitablemente de los problemas del costo que tiene para los países que no protegen su medio ambiente participar en el comercio internacional. Esto sí que es un elemento y un instrumento de una inmensa importancia que hoy todos los países, eh, prácticamente los países en vía de desarrollo, no tenemos que ignorar que de ahora en adelante la incursión del tema ambiental en los problemas comerciales va a ser un tema de una presencia y de una importancia creciente. Entonces, yo diría que la comunidad internacional, la, 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 la opinión pública se está moviendo, la comunidad internacional está reaccionando. ¿Cómo hacemos entonces nosotros a nivel de país, una reflexión a nivel de país, qué tendríamos que hacer en América Latina, en este continente, con esta cantidad de recursos naturales, con esta conciencia política creciente, eh, con esta conciencia social cada vez más demandante? ¿Qué podemos hacer? Yo creo que aquí... Yo diría que el tema, en cierta manera, lo está dando la, Laudato Si, el Papa Francisco, cuando nos está hablando de la necesidad de tener pactos y nacionales e internacionales que nos permitan abordar colectivamente el tema. Bueno, yo creo que cada vez más es necesario que la variable medioambiental y cambio climático forme parte de grandes pactos internacionales, pero también nacionales. Yo creo que es necesario incorporar en los debates nacionales el, el elemento ambiental y el elemento preservación de la naturaleza y cuidado del clima. Me parece que son factores que crecientemente habría que ubicarlos en esta materia. Yo creo que eh, es cierto que hay factores negativos en este campo, y me estoy refiriendo, por ejemplo, muchas veces a la forma como las inversiones y el mercado, buscando la ganancia de la inversión, lo hace a expensas y a costo del deterioro del medio ambiente. Lo hemos visto en las inversiones nacionales e inversiones internacionales. Ahí hay un problema. Es decir, cada vez más en la preparación de, la, de los programas y proyectos de inversión, el tema ambiental va a ser un factor creciente si queremos realmente participar de la comunidad internacional y, y de los beneficios de ese comercio. También están, como dije anteriormente, vinculado a este tema, la necesidad de salir al encuentro de los grandes bolsones de pobreza que necesariamente e inevitablemente son factores perturbadores del medio ambiente y contaminadores. Yo agregaría también a veces los temas económicos mismos, que se convierten en muchos países en factores que con tal de salir del encuentro de la crisis y la balanza de pago, aceptan cualquier tipo de inversiones sin tomar de vida en cuenta la relación de las inversiones con el medio ambiente. Yo creo que la necesidad de pactos 
es, a mi modo de ver, un tema fundamental. Y en ese sentido, la dirección de esos pactos tiene varios, varios grandes capítulos sobre los cuales los países tendrán que trabajar. Uno es, por supuesto, el tema de la energía. Está muy claro que la energía fósil en pocos años va a desaparecer en el uso en muchos sectores de actividad. El problema es cómo encontrar espacio para que el tema de las energías renovables puedan incursionar dentro de los programas de desarrollo. Esto se está haciendo, los bancos están contribuyendo a eso, muy importante lo que instituciones como el Banco Interamericano, el Banco Mundial, la CAF, están haciendo cuando al intervenir en los proyectos de desarrollo ingresan con condiciones que significan acomodar el proceso de inversión para que sea respetuoso de la naturaleza y permitan, por tanto, evitar la contaminación o la destrucción del medio ambiente. Yo creo que en ese sentido, en, en los proyectos, ahí hay un tema importante. El tema de programar para plazos y, y tiempos determinados de, de el hecho de que las energías renovables formen parte creciente de la, el, la patrón energética de los países, que de alguna manera va a ser el elemento fundamental en el cual más tarde o más temprano los países tendrán que acomodarse. Yo creo que ahí, en ese gran pacto nacional, ese variable de salir de la, de la contaminación que proviene del uso de las energías contaminantes es un factor fundamental que hay que incorporar dentro del esquema. El otro gran tema, que también formará parte, es todo el tema del transporte, donde hay también avances significativos en el sentido de encontrar desde la logística hasta la formación de los medios de transporte, forma parte también de otro de los temas de enorme poder en la contaminación. Se están incorporando factores como la propia organización de las ciudades, que, cuyo, cuyo diseño cada vez más forma parte de elementos que van entrando en, el, en, en, el, en, la, en la forma como la ciudad misma evita generar forma, fuentes de contaminación. Yo creo que, terminando, que en todo esto, para si hacemos el diálogo, yo creo que en todo esto ha habido un, hay una conciencia nueva en el mundo. Y creo que esa conciencia tiene que ser parte de la política económica como tal. Esto no se arregla simplemente con una solución parcial que pueda ser tomado frente a un tema específico. Es un tema global que debe formar parte de las grandes decisiones de los programas y políticas económicas y que en esa forma podamos de alguna manera hacer que la actitud de los países en territorio sea una actitud responsable. De hecho, sea de paso, yo creo que ese tema está tomando conciencia en América Latina. Ha sido comentado mucha, en muchas oportunidades si los grandes países de América Latina que tienen grandes bosques están procediendo a la destrucción de los mismos. Sí, ha habido experiencias, pero hay también reacciones. Y yo creo que hoy por hoy he observado que se está hablando cada vez más de una diplomacia eh, del tema de que no es solamente alcanza con ser consciente en cuanto a la sufrición de acuerdos, es una puesta en marcha de políticas específicas en ese campo. Lo que están haciendo algunos países como Brasil y Colombia de atender a estos llamados, yo creo que hay que destacarlo. Yo creo que los países están reaccionando y van hacia formas que permitan de alguna manera mantener la, la, la presencia del tema de la preservación de los bosques como un elemento importante para ellos y para, y para el mundo en su conjunto. En concreto, yo diría, y termino aquí, yo creo que el mundo ha, hecho, ha tomado conciencia de esto. Ha tomado conciencia en los últimos, la verdad que estamos hablando en los últimos 50 años, ¿eh? pero finalmente se logró. Y yo creo que eso va a ir creciendo. Y va a ir creciendo por la presión de los sectores populares, por el impulso dinámico que le dan las jóvenes generaciones, por la propia inclusión del tema en los programas de desarrollo de los países que va a condicionar las formas y maneras de inversión. Y por último, porque realmente estamos en presencia de una demanda de la cual depende las futuras generaciones. Yo creo que el tema del cambio climático es una gran responsabilidad con el creador para los que, para los que forman parte 
de esa, de esa convicción, de esa creencia, ciertamente ese gran pacto de la creación tiene que acomodarse a las políticas que lleven adelante los países y la comunidad internacional para hacer del medio ambiente, de la preservación de la naturaleza, una gran fuente de compromiso colectivo, pero además también de inspiración, para que esas tecnologías que nos están dando, las maravillas que estamos viendo todos los días, sean capaces de avanzar en el campo de la sustitución de, la, de, de las energías contaminantes, la incursión en ciertas medidas de protección de la naturaleza, que sean creadoras y que permitan asociarse al desarrollo económico y social, y poder un poco en este gran compacto llevar adelante medidas que nos permitan salir de, de, la, de las grandes contradicciones en que el mundo entró en los últimos siglos. Yo soy optimista porque, como le digo, recuerdo lo que fueron los debates que permitieron hacer aceptable el término. El término era difícil aceptar el problema del medio ambiente y, y cómo de, después empezó a despertarse la creatividad, aún dentro de los países de desarrollo. Los 14 tipos de energía que en algún momento se pusieron a discutir permitieron que, por ejemplo, aparecieran avances en la, en la energía derivado de las, de la, de las, del azúcar, por ejemplo, del alcohol, que fue una forma inteligente que se derivó precisamente de aquellos movimientos que partieron en la preparación de aquella famosa conferencia. Bueno, habiendo vivido un poco el, el pasado, viendo un poco lo que fueron las luchas para darle importancia a este tema, yo creo que estamos en presencia de una reacción de la comunidad internacional que va a continuar, porque está en manos, como digo, de fuerzas políticas que continúan presionando, y la propia opinión pública que se va a convertir cada vez más en el actor dominante en la demanda por un mejor ambiente y un cambio climático controlado para evitar la pérdida de vida en el planeta, en este planeta que Dios nos dio. Thank you very much. Perdón, muchísimas gracias don Enrique por sus reflexiones, por su perspectiva que nos ha permitido poner en, 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 en este, este, este debate en una mirada más larga sobre sus orígenes, su, sobre el desarrollo y sobre las obligaciones que tenemos como comunidades nacionales y como comunidad internacional en la preservación y el uso inteligente del ambiente. We are now going to switch to English and uh, I would like to uh, remember those who are using the translation that we are interpreting this uh, symposium in Spanish, Portuguese and, and, and uh, English. And so for those of you who are listening to Don Enrique in English, and please switch, switch back to, to Spanish as it was uh, the case before. It was a little bit of a complication. So today's event is available in English, Spanish and Portuguese and the channels are on the icon that you can see at the, in the bottom right side of your screens. So without any further delay, I would like to turn the floor to the moderator of the panel that will discuss Don Enrique's presentation and also other Uh, we'll make other presentations as well on the topic of today to my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Ana Maria Videgain from the School of Religious Studies of Florida International University uh, and also a co-organizer of this event. Professor Videgain, your floors are your, yours. Don Enrique, you're welcome to stay to hear our colleagues making their remarks. Thank you very much. I know. Thank you very much, President Solis. Um, good morning. Uh, buenos dias, buen dia. Um, I am Ana Maria Videgain, a professor at the, the President Solis, a professor at the Religious Studies Department, but also an affiliate faculty at LAC. And I would like to thank you, everybody, for joining us Uh, in these four days that is a multicultural, multilinguistic, multireligious, multiracial, and a world event. And uh, our following panel, Integral Ecology, Challenges, Examples, and Good Practices, Assembly, uh, four excellent panelists. Our Archbishop Thomas Welsky for the Archidiocese of Miami, 
Carlos Muñoz Piña from uh, Indosoc, a uh, friend institution in Mexico. Uh, Whitney Bauman, our um, associate professor at the Religious Study, my colleague, and also um, uh, one of the uh, organizers of this event. And Daniel Castillo, an assistant professor in theology in the University of Loyola. According to the suggested methodology, I will introduce each panelist who will have the first 10 minutes presentation to develop their minds, ideas on integral ecology. Later, the panelists will have another few minutes to exchange their point of view and discuss. And of course, if Don Enrique would like to intervene, he will, will be a very good, he will be very welcome. Um, then uh, all participants also are allowed to make questions and comments. At the bottom of your screen, there is an option for Q&A. And also you can do the, your question in Spanish, English or Portuguese, and we will manage the situation and we will translate and uh, pass. And I will pass the question to the, to the panelists as much as we, we will be able to do it. With the, 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 the time factor. Then I will introduce and give the floor for each panelist. And we will start with Monsignor Wensky. Um, I would let you, I will introduce Monsignor Wensky. Uh, was born in West Palm Beach. This is a Floridian. His parents were Polish, but he learned to speak Spanish, he said, with a Cuban accent in Miami. Right? where he was ordained as a priest in 1976. Even though he speaks uh, excellent Spanish, it's a wonderful, but later he learned to speak Asian Creole, serving the Asian community for almost two decades. Appointed bishops in 1997, he served as also auxiliary bishops and director of the Catholic Charities for six years. He moved to Orlando as bishop of that diocese until returning to Miami, where he was appointed, appointed as bishop by Pope Benedict in uh, 2010. He has served as president of several commission of the US Conference of Bishops. Uh, such as um, migration, justice and peace, religious freedom, and he has been always very um, near the, our uh, migrant communities in, in Miami. Then the floor is for Monsignor Wensky. Thank you very much for showing us. Muchas gracias. Gracias for this uh, introduction. Uh, this week is a special week for our Jewish brothers and sisters because they celebrate their high holy days and uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and we're reminded of their phrase, Tikkun Olam, which could be translated as repairing the world. And really, that is what uh, the topic of this conference is about, is to repair the world. Uh, and, and Pope Francis is out out to see with a contribution to that effort. It is, as, uh, as our uh, presenter has already uh, indicated, a rich and complex document, uh, one that is much more than just a treatise on climate change. I remember I saw one commentator who said that to make Laudato see just about climate change would be like making the Thanksgiving dinner just about the cranberries. And Laudato see. Pope Francis, as popes have done in previous social encyclicals, attempts to engage the world in a dialogue. In doing so, he presents a vision of the human person, of our place and our dignity in the world, which the church recognizes as both fallen and redeemed. Thus, it is a vision that is rooted in the gospel and is enshrined in the church's moral teachings. The Holy Father declares that we need only to take a frank look at the facts to see that our common home is falling into serious disrepair. In the encyclical, Pope Francis is more than just a popular doom, however. He certainly doesn't pull any punches in addressing the problems we face, but 
In doing so, he explains that human life is grounded in three fundamental and closely intertwined relationships. Our relationship with God, with our neighbor, and with the earth itself. Scriptures tell us that these three vital relationships have been broken, both outwardly and within us. And this rupture is called sin. The harmony between the creator, humanity, and creation was disrupted by our presuming to take the place of God and refusing to acknowledge our creaturely limitations. In our relationships with the earth, the Holy Father zeroes in on the impacts of pollution, lack of clean water, toxic waste, and climate change, the latter of which he calls one of the principal challenges facing humanity in our day. Pope Francis is just as frank about the state of our human relationships. He emphasizes that our ecological challenges weigh heavily on those who can least carry the burden, the poor. We know that those who suffer in poverty have a special claim on our attention, and we should seek to consider how our decisions impact those struggling for survival and look for ways to deepen our solidarity with them. Evidence of contamination in our relationships with others doesn't end there. Our throwaway culture has extended to human beings as well. We throw away life in the womb, and the Holy Father writes repeatedly about the destruction of embryos in this encyclical. We neglect the disabled and show little respect for the lives and the contributions of the elderly. In our current age, human beings themselves have become commodities of desire. Human trafficking has become a massive global industry, a juggernaut of filth and slavery, fueled by a pollution of the heart that is not easily remediated. Internationally, where aid to developing countries displaces the unique cultural realities of peoples, the loss can also be quite significant. And so the Pope writes, the disappearance of a culture can be just as serious, and, or even more serious, than the, this, than the disappearance of a species of plant or animal. And so to undertake this great work that La Dauti Sea sets before us, we must restore all our relationships in a full way. In section four of the encyclical, Pope Francis uses the term integral ecology. And he uses this term to explain the idea that everything is connected. Drawing on the thought of his predecessors, he explains that this regard for the duty to cultivate and maintain a proper relationship with our neighbor ruins our relationship with our own selves, with others, with God, and with the earth. When all these relationships are neglected, when justice no longer dwells in the land, the Bible tells us that life itself is endangered. Thus, Pope Francis wants us to connect the dots between what could be called a natural ecology and what might be called a human or social ecology. And so he sets forth the argument for an integral ecology. An integral ecology demands that rainforests be protected because of what they do potentially and what they do actually for the flourishing of the human species on this earth. But likewise, marriage and the family ought to be respected and protected. And just as we favor laws that limit the danger of pollutants damaging our sensitive ecosystems, do we not be concerned about the toxic waste of pornography and its effect on the human ecology of the young? With all these challenges and the area of human ecology, the Pope explains, it becomes difficult to hear the cry of nature itself. Can we hope to care for the gifts of the earth if we cannot care for one another? But despite all this, Pope Francis really does weave together a hopeful message in Laudato Si. He tells us that the Creator does not abandon us. He will never forsake his loving plan, or, rep or he never repents of having created us. Humanity still has the ability to work together in building our common home. Our human nature, like Mother Nature itself, is a gift of the Creator who designed its intrinsic order, and in this way provided the instructions for us to consult. In Manila, 
When he visited the Philippines after a devastating typhoon, Pope Francis, citing a popular adage, said, God always forgives. We sometimes forgive, but nature, but when nature or creation is mistreated, she never forgives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Archbishop Blinsky. Now um, we will have a Carlos Munoz Piña. Um, he is an economist with a master's degree in environmental economics from the University College of London and a PhD in natural resources economics from the University of California at Berkeley with the studies in public policy from the Goldman School of Government. He has worked as an environmental economist at the London Environmental Economic Center in the United Kingdom and in Mexico at various institutions. He has been a consultant for the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and the African Development Bank. He has advised companies and community initiative uh, for sustainable development through poor strength and the United States Forest Service in Peru, Bolivia, Tanzania, South Africa, Kazakhstan, Jordan, and the hydroelectric basin of China, among others. As a university student, he participated as a volunteer in human rights and economic development project with the Diocese of San Cristobal in Mexico. In Mexico. He also volunteered in Guatemala refugee camp maintained by Caritas uh, on the southern border of Mexico. With church groups, he supported coffee cooperative works in uh, Nicaragua and keeping along with other productive projects in indigenous communities and mejillas in Michoacán, Puebla, Chiapas, and Osaka. He has recently collaborated as an advisor to social entrepreneurship teams indirectly as a counselor of the Reforestamos Mexico and directly through the University of Environment at the Superior Technological Institute of Mexico, where he was an advisor uh, to Rutopia, the hub project of the community tourism that won the International Heart Award in 2019. He has been teaching in various academic institutions in Mexico and the United States, and he has published articles in academic journals. But also, um, he is uh, related to Indosoc, the institution, um, the Sydney institution in Mexico, who has been working for years developing the social teaching of the church. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Carlos, for being with us. Thank you, Ana Maria. Thank you, Ana Maria. And thank you, uh, Florida International uh, University, for inviting me over. Uh, uh, you are an institution with great influence in Latin America and the Caribbean, and it's a great forum to be here, um, to be sharing with you. And I would like to start uh, by, by mentioning um, that when I first began to read the encyclical Laudato Si, uh, someone at Indosoc told me that uh, Pope Francis has, had written it basically by listening. Instead of just saying, talking to the people, he was listening to the people. And what we have is a synthesis of what the Catholic Church had been learning through its communities, diverse communities, all across the world, and, and, and he was just synthesizing what was there, connecting it uh, with theology, connecting it to religious practice, but listening to the people. So I wanted to talk here uh, with you in this panel by uh, telling you about five images, five images I got from the labor of Indosoc of beginning to share Laudato Si with its different communities all across Mexico with the different church groups and, um, and uh, workshops with youth and organizers. 
And I decided that five images would summarize very well what, uh, what I was seeing. Because um, for me, the encyclical has very, a very clear point that there are always trade-offs, that whenever nature is being protected, you have to be looking at the economic side, at the human side, at the reduction of poverty angle of everything. And at the same time, when uh, communities are advancing, when uh, poverty is being overcome, the way the economy grows puts pressure on the environment. So those two things are interplay and they are not an easy choice. They are never an easy choice where one has to navigate individually and collectively to achieve the best outcome. So, well, here are the images. The first one was, uh, we were in a video seminar already with the pandemic in, and um, I was talking with a group of young entrepreneurs uh, linked to uh, different uh, uh, church groups. And one of them, a young woman was speaking from Oaxaca. And in the background, you could see that she was in a shed, it just had installed a computer next to a, a, a node. And behind her, you could see the bales of cotton being moved from one side to the other because her family were, uh, they are uh, cotton workers, the growers and harvesting cotton. And she was saying that for her, the Laudato Si was about um, uh, reducing the impact of pesticides on the community because she saw it. She saw that the, her family, her, uh, the other workers, she was in a break, um, were sometimes sick, had rashes, had um, uh, the agrochemicals were very harsh on them as, as you know, to their health. And she was sure that that same thing was happening to the uh, coastal vegetation, to the rest of, the, of nature, of the creation around her. And it, it was very difficult for her to connect or to make peace with the idea that this was an income generating, that it was generating the income for her family, but at the same time causing damage. So it was, well, how will she solve it? She has read Laudato Si, she's listening to everything. And she said, well, what I want is to begin to have a harvesting mechanism of growing cotton, uh, growing cotton with lower environmental impact. And I want to find out which agrochemicals are uh, better for the environment and how can we do organic farming? And she was already out there, there looking at the solutions and thinking in practice, how would she move the entire thing that was like this big machine, economic machine around her towards that goal and talking, organizing with other uh, young people in Oaxaca and she was there. So I said, that, that is a very clear image that the trade-offs and the transition is not easy and it's even less easy to do it for the poorer communities because if they do it, if cotton is more expensive because they're using a, a cleaner mechanisms, then someone would need to buy this cotton at a 10% more, 20% more. And the economy should be recognizing the value of that organic farming. So the deal, dealing with the transition and accommodating the rest of the economy around her, around the idea, was not easy, but she was there. The second image uh, was here in Mexico City. I was talking with a uh, again, a church group from the outskirts of Mexico City, uh, where there are very, uh, a lot of small firms working with the, uh, connected to the industrial uh, ecosystem or the industrial fabric of, of Northern Mexico City. And she was saying, yes, I am organizing my uh, uh, volunteer group because one thing we're seeing is that they are uh, dumping um, uh, chemicals to in certain cracks in the ground. And the, it is a very small factory and they're just dumping their wastewater that has agrochemicals. And I'm very worried that that is going to pollute the water uh, underneath the water where we get our own water for drinking. And she said, well, and I'm kind of afraid because we're a very small group and these firms uh, generate employment. So if we put too much pressure, they will close and somebody will be out of work. So, and I said, well, how will she solve it? She's uh, dealing with the Laudato, see the trade-off between one and the other and the transition. And um, 
I, and she was very gentle. She said, and, and very much in the spirit of the Laudato Si, she said, I will be approaching them and talking with the owners and the workers there and telling them that they're damaging Mother Earth, they're uh, damaging uh, God's creation, but the way they will do it is, can they get a credit to clean the water? Can they have another system? So she was using the dialogue to begin to effect change on this thing. And it was in the center of the community. And she said, well, and if they get aggressive and if they um, put pressure on us, what should I do? So I thought immediately, well, this is the idea of the environmental defenders and the way that she was not alone. She felt supported by the church around. And if anything happened, if there was conflict, if the peaceful dialogue didn't work out and there was conflict, she would be backed up. There would be someone defending the defenders. And that links to this other uh, initiative, the Escazú uh, initiative, where um, in Latin America is an agreement by the governments to make environmental information transparent and must be signed by all countries to, to be uh, in, in effect. In a way, it is a system to defend the environmental defenders. And, and, and if someone in um, part of the constituency of the Florida International University, if you have influence in your own countries, look at the Escazú agreement and uh, push towards signing it because it's a way to defend a woman like her that she was in the community working for, for them. My, my third image, and I have just a couple of minutes, so I'll, I'll have to cut one short, is when I went to the seminary to talk with the future priests in the uh, west of Mexico. It is the uh, Archidiocese of Zamora, and I was going to talk about uh, Laudato Si. I went with my uh, uh, Aunt Patty to be talking to the seminarists, and they were talking with her and showing her around. And I said, well, climate change and the way uh, we have to uh, have a low carbon economy, substitute fossil fuels to generate electricity and use solar and wind energy. And they said, oh yes, yes, here in the seminar, we come to a roof, professor. So I went with the, to the roof with them and it was some very old, it was probably 1800s uh, building and it was full of uh, solar panels. And I told them, well, uh, who, who came up with this idea? Was it the uh, sustainability group of the, uh, in, in, in the seminar? And said, no, no, no. It was the economist at the seminar that said that we were going to save around 20% of our electricity bill just by installing the panels. So the, the, the Laudato Si group just uh, uh, found out about this after it was being installed. It was a credit, a 10 year credit, et cetera. So it said, well, perfect. So it, it was from the economic side that you were going to save. And with the savings, you can do more social work. So why don't you begin to do it in all the other uh, archidioceses or all the other dioceses in, in, in Michoacan? And it, that way, it, they began to start. It was also some an economic reason, but also linked to the wider climate change. We want to reduce the impact. We need to reduce the greenhouse gases going to the atmosphere. And that was a one step, one diocese by diocese change. So um, just having just one minute, I'll use this, this other image in which there was a group defending human rights in, the, uh, in Puebla, in the um, eastern part of, uh, central eastern part of Mexico. And this church group was dealing with a very harsh uh, issue, which was a, a uh, abuse of uh, young women by uh, criminal organizations and uh, for prostitution. And they were very well organized. It was a very strong group working everything. And they said, and one of the things we want to do is to clean the river. And I said, well, and how is that connected? And, this, and this, they said, if we have a clean river, it's a place that is safe to walk around. So women are less vulnerable. So by protecting nature, we're also protect, protecting women. And if we have to go in and demand the factories that are dumping wastewater and we are organizing, it is for us part of the same thing. So for them, human rights and the human right to a, a healthy environment were so connected that action in both of them was at the same time. So with this, I'll, I'll end uh, with the final image, which is Rutopia, the, the group I advised that they were dealing with forest communities 
that they were between a rock and a hard place. If they wanted to generate in income, they would have to take down the tropical forest and put corn and cattle. But if they wanted to protect the environment, they would forego the income of that. So they created um, like an Airbnb um, internet way of connecting the ecotourism communities working in the forest, generating income, and at the same time protecting the forest. So that was also a sign of hope that when I saw Laudato Si, I said, well, this is actually a mirror. It is just the Pope listening to all these experiences all across the world and reflecting it back to us. So Ana Maria, thank you. And sorry for going over the time. No, thank you very much, Carlo. Thank you. And we will keep in touch with him. So can you? Thank you. Now, uh, Whitney Bauman will have the, will have the floor. Whitney Bauman is an associate professor at the Religious Study, is my colleague at the Florida International University in Miami. He is also co-founder and co-director of Counterpoint Navigating Knowledge, a nonprofit based in Berlin, Germany, that holds public discussion over social and ecological issues related to globalization and climate change. His areas of research interest fall under the theme of religion, science, and globalization. And he is the recipient of a Fulbright Fellowship and a Humboldt Fellowship. His publication covers religion and ecology, developing a planetary ethics at the Columbia University Press in 1919, and co authored with Kevin O'Brien on environmental ethics and uncertainty tackling wicked problems by Douglas. He is currently working on a manuscript. Uh, about the 19th century German romantic scientist Ernest Eckel. Then the floor to for you, Winnie. Okay, thank you, Anna Maria. And it's so nice to be here with all of you. Um, I'm enjoying listening uh, and seeing the fruits of the of the organization that we've been doing over the past. Well, I've been helping out for six months, but it's been going longer than that. So okay. nice to see you all. Um, so I, um, as Anna Maria mentioned, my big area of research is religion and ecology and religion and nature. And one of the um, things that I do, I'm teaching an earth ethics class every year, and I always start that class by asking my students, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of nature? I'm just going to start my timer so I don't go over it. Okay. Um, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you, when you think of the word nature? And inevitably, it's uh, trees in the blue sky, whales, mountains. Uh, sometimes it's the earth, the image of the earth. But very rarely, it's their bodies, <laughs> human beings. Very rarely is it the city of Miami, the computers that we're talking through. And so, and so what, what I say to them is, how is it that we have thought ourselves outside of the planet? And how can we rethink ourselves back into the planet? And to me, that's what integral ecology is all about, is rethinking humans and culture back into the rest of the natural world. And so for me, this, this field of religion and ecology, this is what they're doing. There's um, uh, one of the major organizations is the Forum on Religion and Ecology at Yale University. And that, that organization has been there for 30 years. Um, I can put a link in the, in the chat box after I'm done. Uh, looking at Christianity and ecology, Judaism and ecology, Buddhism and ecology, so on and so forth. And they work with the United Nations Environmental Program and promoting uh, conversations around Laudato Si, around the Earth Charter, with religious communities all over the world. So it's, that's, the, that's the sort of feel that, um, that, that I locate myself in. And within that, the project that I'm working on, um, again, uh, has to do with how to think about ourselves, how, how to reattune ourselves to the world that we live in today, since the, um, the twin phenomena of globalization and climate change have forever changed uh, the world around us. Um, so globalization, especially with um, uh, since the great acceleration that started around World War II with this fossil fueled reality that sped up production, communication and transportation technologies. So that, that made the world a lot smaller. Um, but it also made time a lot faster. I call this the fossil fueled time that we all live in, flying around the world all the time and this sort of thing. Uh, literally living too fast for our own bodies and outstripping the carrying capacity of the planet this way. Right, which leads to climate change, right? which, which is also to me uh, a reminder that we are indeed of this earth. We are indeed part of this world. We cannot manage it. Um, every time we try to manage it, we, every time we think we've, we've made progress, then, then this progress has a, a, a sort of 
a, a dark underside that, that creates uh, undevelopment somewhere or creates climate change or species extinction or deforestation, so on and so forth. So I guess part of what my project is, is how do we then rethink ourselves uh, back into the rest of the natural world as first and foremost planetary creatures. So I'm trying to think about this, uh, this metaphor of, of what I call um, constructing a critical planetary romanticism or CPR for the earth. <laughs> and uh, the CPR for the earth uh, has, has three basic um, ideas that I, that, I, that I wanna discuss with you today. One of those is um, thinking, thinking, uh, getting ourselves away from this fossil fueled time, this time of chronology, this time of progress, this linear sort of understanding of, of, of uh, so sort of everything's progressing somehow, and this is all going to be done through more and more technology and better technology. So what I want to want to argue is that we ought to rethink this and think about planetary times. So time is multiple. We have to think with the time of trees and the time of river, rivers, the time of a geological time, the time of the deep time of evolutionary theory, uh, the deep time of, of cosmic time, right? So it's not just this human chronos time that's now fuel, uh, fossil fueled, but we have to think with this, this bubbling um, emergent type of time. Um, and it's also a time that sort of is meandering, right? So in, there's a great German word for this type of walk called Spaziergehen. Uh, it's sort of just going on a random Sunday walk with no point to it, right? There's, <laughs> there's not an end telos, but it's sort of more of, of a meandering, right? So, 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 think, so think in this kind of time. And I, 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 I do think that um, if anything, for many of us, this pandemic time has really jolted us out of <laughs> this fossil fueled understanding of time and, and, and enable us to see, to break open into this sort of multiple time and, and watching you know, a pair of hawks outside my window, and right where I've never noticed them before, because I'm usually too busy, uh, you know, flying around the world to give lectures like this or something. Um, so, so thinking about time in this multiple, but also um, planetary pace. Um, and another thing that enables us to do, I, I would hope, is to pay attention to the very slow violence of of climate change. Rob Nixon is a, a, wrote this book called Slow Violence, and it's, it describes the type of violence that results from environmental destruction. It's not usually um, a forest burning or being cut down, but it's also the, all the toxins that end up causing cancers and birth defects that, that spread over multiple generations. If climate change were five airplanes crashing every day, then we'd do something about it. Um, but it's, it's, it's usually, it's, we can't see it in one place, so how can we stop slow down enough so that we can see the violence um, that's caused to um, different bodies um, around the planet. Which brings me to the second point of this CPR for the earth, which is um, to think about bodies in a planetary way. Um, and uh, I follow sort of the preferential option of the poor here that comes out of liberation theology and extending that as Leonardo Boff and others have done um, to, um, to include the earth itself and earth, other earth bodies as part of the poor, this sort of thing. But to think about our, our bodies as porous and entangled, right? We are, our, our microbiomes make up more of the, the cells in this body than our human cells do, right? So, so we really are these ecosystems within ourself and, and part of this evolutionary entanglement and part of even a, a cosmic entanglement, some would say. So how can we think about um, uh, our porous entangled bodies, but also in a way that, uh, that pays attention to how fossil fuel time and the way that we construct our worlds is, is detrimental to multiple Earth bodies. Uh, this is why, uh, this is why uh, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, um, Extinction Rebellions, things, these sorts of things. That's why these matter so much because uh, they're, 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 put, they're holding a, a, a spotlight on the problems of modernity and the problems of the way that we've constructed our modern sort of fossil fueled world. Um, all bodies are not affected equally, so to speak. So, so that's, that's the second part. And then the third part, which I'll leave you with, um, is, is then thinking about knowledge um, in, a, in, a, in a planetary way. So planetary knowledge. What is the university for? <laughs> um, I think that part of the, part of the problem uh, with the university today is that the, the old disciplines that come out of you know, Europe and Germany, especially in the 19th century, just don't map on to the messy planetary realities anymore. And so we need to undiscipline the university and rethink about how we uh, rethink about education in a way that's promoting um, uh, planetary well-being and, 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 and in the ways that, in some of the ways that um, Francis uh, mentioned in Laudato Si. So 
Undisciplining un undisciplining the university um, and then rethinking it based upon critical theories, based upon environmental thought, these sorts of things, decolonial thought, post-colonial thought, so that we can, we can educate towards um, a more integral uh, way of living on the planet. And I think this, there's hope. I think I, you can see little bits of this happening um, with the whole renaming and tearing down of statues in the U.S. right now, and, and re, the re-narrations based upon things like uh, critiques of, of of racism and sexism and and these sorts of things. So, so I do think that we can rename and re-narrate. Um, it'll just take um, uh, <laughs> a lot more uh, uh, discussions like this to do so. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Winnie. Then we will uh, give the floor to Daniel Castillo. Uh, Daniel, uh, he is originally from Miami and was very happy to come in person to visit us. But well, we hope that shortly we can have him join us at the Florida International University. We can invite him to come. Uh, he holds a um, doctor of theology from the University of Notre Dame, and he is currently an associate professor at the Yoda University School of Theology in Marina. In 2019, he published An Ecological Theology of Liberation, Salvation, and Political Ecology, a book which was won several awards. Gustavo Gutierrez who I assume was one of his professors at the University of Notre Dame, prefaces his book. And there was, uh, Gutierrez notes that Daniel Castillo gave a theological answer to a central question for the church today. How are salvation, liberation, and care of creation related? And Daniel, in his book, not only shows his connection and argues theologically with the Bible Foundation, but also offers proposal for action. And also would say that, unfortunately, I hope that soon this book will be translated in Spanish, but for now, for the Spanish-speaking participants who um, would like to mention that Daniel recently published in Spanish an article in Pagins at the Bartolomé de las Casas Institute in Lima, Peru, hacia una teología ecológica de la liberación a partir de la obra de Gustavo Gutiérrez. Well, he has published also several articles on integral ecology, justice, and peace, and human rights. Then um, I give the floor to our uh, young panelist, um, Daniel Castillo. Thank you, Dr. Beragain. And uh, thank you to uh, FIU for inviting me. <clears throat> it's good to uh, be coming home even if uh, virtually. Um, I would like to, in my brief remarks today, I want to do two things. Uh, the first is sketch out some of the contours of the way in which Pope Francis and Laudato Si conceptualizes what he calls the global system. And um, after doing this, I would like the second thing is to juxtapose uh, his understanding of the global system to uh, the organizing concept of Laudato Si Integral Ecology, right, what this panel has been about. Um, before doing those, let me just define one term that I'll throw around uh, at different points, um, which is political ecology. Also, I'll talk about political ecological systems, political ecological, political ecological concepts. What I mean by that basically is the way a political ecology is a way in which human communities exercise their agency to organize the oikos. The ways in which human communities uh, utilize their agency to organize the oikos. And oikos, I leave untranslated in Greek, it means household or home, and has two kind of derivatives in English, right, that are important particularly for this uh, conversation economics and ecology. And so we leave it untranslated because both of those for Francis are interwoven with one another. So the ways in which political ecology is the ways in which human agency, uh, human communities exercise their agency to shape the, the, the socioeconomic and ecological character of our home. 
Okay, so the global system then is the dominant way in which human communities are doing that today. So how does Francis conceptualize this global system? First, we can say that it is a liberalized capitalist system with roots in a co various legacies of extractive colonialism. And as a liberalized capitalist uh, system, it prioritizes, uh, it is structured to prioritize the facilitation of endless accumulation of wealth. This is the, the aim of this system. This growth, this accumulation of wealth is uh, asymmetrical in character and this creates vast material inequalities and perpetuates vast material inequalities um, throughout the world. This growth uh, also puts tremendous strain on the biosphere and its composite ecosystems threatening the ecological health of the planet. Uh, the third point here then is the ecological degradation that the global system produces is also asymmetrically distributed so that certain zones of enjoyment can obscure the realities of ecological degradation and live uh, in, 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 war, in zones of enjoyment, in zones that are distanced um, from the, the most acute, at least for the moment, the most acute uh, instances of or effects of ecological degradation. Um, whereas uh, the zones inhabited by the material and materially impoverished are subjected to more intensely, are subjected more intensely to pollution and other environmental harms. So this describes in you know, broad, broad strokes some of the material uh, dimensions of the global system. But Francis is also at pains to point to some of the ide ideological dimensions of this global system, what congeals the system, what holds it together. And he names in particular uh, two of these dimensions. Uh, the first is the ideological dimension um, of, of technocracy, so the, the technocratic way of seeing the world, right? And this way of seeing the world, as Francis notes, reduces the earth and its living creatures to mere objects that can be infinitely uh, manipulated in the service of facilitating more growth, more, more wealth. From this perspective, from this way of seeing, um, there is, the earth has no integrity of it in of itself, right? It is simply base matter that it exists to be improved upon. So uh, Marx and Engels famously wrote, and we can disagree with them on any number of points, but on this, I, I would certainly hold to it. Marx and Engels wrote that one of the effects of capitalism, of capital, is it reduces everything that appears to be solid to air. It melts everything into air to be reorganized. When they, when they make this claim, they're concerned about the way in which we've organized society, social relations. But I would submit to you that this holds true also, and Francis is noting this with regard to the technocratic paradigm, with the way in which uh, the technocratic paradigm shapes the, the structures of the earth, the ecological dimensions of the earth. It takes all of these things that have their own integrity and says we can melt them down into air to reform them in ways that are more productive. And that becomes the organizing kind of question um, for the, the technocratic ideology is how do we take these structures, melt them down to create uh, more productive ways of living? Not how do we increase the beauty, the, the justness of a place, but how do we extract the maximum amount of wealth from these places? The second ideological dimension at work in the global system is what Francis elaborates on uh, to a great extent is that of uh, the culture of consumerism, so a consumerist ideology. And here I'd like to point to the work of uh, global sociologist Leslie Sclare, who in, in my view says some, uh, a number of things that are very similar to uh, Francis and Laudato Si. And what Sclare points to is that 
the mechanisms of the global system necessarily need to create a consumer ideology, a culture ideology of consumerism to portray life lived at its most fullest, the human person fully alive as the consuming person. This is because we need, uh, the system requires greater and greater and greater um, modes of consumption in order to keep the system as it is set up functioning. So we're taught our desires are, are uh, this, our desires and, uh, we'll just leave it at desires. Our desires are disciplined to, uh, along the modes of consumption, right? This is what we're trained to be. This is how we understand the human person is fully alive. And Francis sees this um, as deeply problematic and so the, the system itself moves us, we're driven to a kind of destructive self-love that, that neglects love of neighbor, love of the earth in order to kind of continually try to save but never be able to save the compulsive drive to consumption. Um, I know that I'm just about at time, so let me say a, a couple brief things here. Um, these, all of these, these characteristics then make up what, what Francis names as the false and superficial political ecology of the global system, right? And he intimates, if you read the, the document together, what you can extract from it is that the global system, then the political ecology of the global system bears a resonance to the political ecology that emerges from the figure of Cain in scripture who murders his brother, flees God, flees the earth, and, and refuses to serve. Um, this is juxtaposed in, throughout the encyclical with the concept of an integral ecology, which Francis, Francis calls us to. At the heart of this call is the preferential option for the poor and for the earth that this has to be what organizes the new global system to emerge. Not the question of how do we accumulate more wealth, but how do we create a just world in which wealth will have to be created, right? But in which speaks to the in, uh, injustices that exist and re, uh, responds to the cries of the earth as well. In my closing remark, I would say that for Francis, the, this is not a, we cannot continue as business as usual approach. With the concept of integral ecology, he's calling the entire global system to a profound conversion. And I would suggest just as a way of uh, being evocative here at the end, maybe we can talk about it some in, in our discussion, but that in light of everything that he says and in light of the broader history of, of our global system, we should be thinking about integral ecology in terms of a political ecology of reparations, both to the earth and to uh, the indigenous uh, communities that have uh, had their land uh, stolen, um, and people of color who have been forced to uh, work as tools for extraction within the, the history of this system. So an integral ecology should be understood as a political ecology of reparations, and also a political ecology of accompaniment. As um, we, can't, we can't dial everything back and in climate change to some degree now is going to be irrevocable. So how do we accompany communities that are going to be most vulnerable, most marginalized um, in the transition uh, amongst uh, the changing biosphere and not just uh, th these communities that are most vulnerable, human communities, but the uh, eco ecosystemic communities that are also going to shift um, their zones where they can exist as uh, the, the decades progress now. I will leave it at that. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Now we will uh, go back to the conversation with all uh, the participants. Um, uh, I would like to know, um, I don't know if Don Enrique is still uh, there, I would like to do some comments. Uh, Don Enrique Iglesias, if you would like to, to share uh, with us.
some of your comments, some comments. Um, debe abrir el, el micrófono, don Enrique. Está en silencio. He's on mute right now. Sí, le estoy, I am telling him. Eh, don Enrique. I know, I know why you didn't hear. Sí. Bueno, well, Look, I, I, I was very pleased to hear the different approaches bringing into the picture, the discussions, practical experiences, and uh, the view of the Laudato Si, tremendous message. And particularly this, this linkage with philosophical approaches, which I found extremely interesting, I must say. Uh, I, I don't have a, a personal uh, experience to judge many of these things because I don't, I'm not, I said at the beginning, I'm not neither a philosopher or a sociologist, but I think that uh, what can emerge from, from, uh, from reading uh, Laudato Si, which I found an extremely good contribution to focus on these issues, is that in essence, uh, uh, this is an immense pact of a creator with, 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 the, with the people that not be in a way uh, seen as, as a challenge, which starts by looking to those things to, to join us and to those things that commit us to work together in favor of a better environment, in favor of the preservation of nature and solution through these things, the different uh, major challenges that the, the, the humanity has today. And, and these this, uh, challenges, everybody, uh, the political leaders, uh, the, 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 the social leaders, the business community, and, and particularly the, the major public opinion, which I think is proving to play a major role and will continue playing a major role. I said in my, in my comments that uh, one of the things which I found extremely encouraging is the uh, sensitiveness of the of the of the young generations to what's happening on and to see how all this is permeating into the public life that the, the begin nature to political parties which are committed to this issue. My feeling is that we need here a new pact and I think that Daniel Castillo said something about it also and also Mr. Bauman. Uh, we need new new major pact that can put together some objectives and be able to to major, it's like in a war, you know. When you have a war, the countries all united to fight against something, which is extraordinary. But in that way, my impression is that we must look to this the degradation of, the, of nature. It is something that we seen as a major war that collectively has to be addressed by everybody. And I think this is this is what, in a way, is, is in the basic uh, uh, message of Laudato Si. And we must achieve a global pact in which different parties agree that something has to be done beyond ideologies, beyond other considerations in order to meet uh, the salvation of earth and the preservation of nature for the development, uh, personal and, and, and physical development of, our, of the community. Uh, that, that's a major comment. I thank you very much for those expressions. I was really very, 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 Impressed about the, what you said and the message that we brought into the discussion. Thank you, Omnia. Uh, we, um, I, I would like to know if uh, Monsignor Wensky would like to to do some comments, and I will go through the through the panelists first, and then I will do some questions that came from the floor from the for the um, participant. But I will give first the word to the panelists. Um, Monsignor Wensky, if we want to add something else? Sure, one word that I did not use in my, uh, my first discussion, and it is part of the whole Laudato Si ethos, is the word stewardship. Now, stewardship is a difficult word to translate into Spanish. Sometimes it's translated as mayor dormia, otra vez uh, como administración. But stewardship is a concept that says we are not owners of what we possess, that we possess them in kind of trust. And so uh, it's a concept used very often in church to get people to uh, contribute their time, talent, and treasure to the advancement of the mission of the church. 
but stewardship is much broader than that in the sense that if we understand our position in this world as being stewards of, uh, then we understand that, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the environment, the world in which we inhabit, the nature that we are responsible for is, is given to us and, and trust for future generations as well. And that, that is another part that, uh, you know, that Pope Francis develops in Laudato Si. This is not only trying to fix the earth or restore the earth for us today, but also to restore it for future generations. And so what I said earlier about relationships, we, we have to have a relationship with God, a relationship with nature, but a relationship with our, uh, our brothers and sisters, our common humanity, but a relationship that also looks to the future and to future generations uh, to come. But thank you, Martin Wensky. Um, I would like to, uh, to go to Bauman, Winning Bauman, if you want to add something else. Yeah, I don't, I don't have much to add, but it's, a, a, again, um, yes to the, everything that I've heard here today, um, and I've learned a lot. I'll, I, will, I will just say that I, I think about, in the terms of this relationality and attending to how we relate to one another, and thinking about um, uh, some of the stories that you brought, Carlos, and some of the um, some of the things that everybody, everybody's been talking about, this idea of, of attending to and 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 stewarding and this sort of thing, I think it also has to include this process of um, ecological grieving and ecological um, uh, ecological despair. And I think that's like one of the one one. We're only going to get we're only going to get through this by going through it, right? But I think along the way we're going to we're going to lose so much, and it's it's so easy to fall into despair. And I think that religions, especially, have something to add when it comes to, yeah. Even though, even though the climate's changing, even though it seems like another end of the world, right? Um, another apocalypse over and over again. Um, there, there, there's still as long as we're still here, we can still move forward in some way and do so in a way that accompanies. <laughs> Um, the, the, the poor and the least of these and this sort of thing. Thanks. Yeah, Carl, uh, Carlos? Yes, I would say that um, I would take this lesson that we need to listen to the oikos. And listening to the oikos is not only listening to the ecology, but also listening to the economy and be taking specific steps. For example, a very specific step is get the U.S as part, as an active part of the Paris Agreement. And Florida and its representatives can play a very important role because it is the Caribbean, it is the Central America, it's the area influence that could be impacted by climate change with the hurricanes stronger, more frequent. And so getting the US to join the Paris Agreement, to be an active part, means also listening to the coal miner workers' families in Virginia. So talking to the bishops there and listening to the concerns and help that transition, that is something that can be done. And that's the only way to do it, to listen to the oikos to both sides. And, um, and yes, if I could bring in some controversy, I would go, uh, um, Daniel saying that consumption is not important. I would say that the economic realities, consumption is part of moderation school, but also uh, being greener in the decisions, not only not taking decisions, that's, that's important. But again, um, we might not have time, but it was uh, uh, very interesting to listen to all four of you with your different perspectives and, and the communities you're talking to. Yeah, well, um, I will give the floor then to, to, Carl, to Daniel. And, and then uh, there is also a question that came from, from the participant. Uh, Daniel? Sure. Um, so I, well, I guess I'll just respond to, to Carlos, which is appropriate because uh, one of the things that is uh, essential in Laudato Si, right? It, it talks about, it calls uh, over and over again for dialogue. Um, so I, I would say I did not say that consumption is not important. I would not hold that, that position, right? What I would say is deeply problematic and what is kind of named as problematic throughout the encyclical is 
homo consumens being held up as the human person fully alive, right? That this understanding of what it means to be human, this reductive understanding of what it means to be human is deeply problematic in the way we relate to one another, in the way we relate to the earth. And I would say it does form a dry, it is the fuel for the global system today. And it's a complicated way to articulate that, but, but I, would, I would hold that. Um, so what the, the, the kind of conception of the human person that I think Francis points to, right, is what, what I would name as homo hortulanus, right? The human person as gardener, the human person as the one who cultivates and cares, who serves and preserves uh, the soil and all that comes from the soil, right? So he points to Genesis 2.15 in kind of uh, elucidating his basic theological anthropology. Now, part of that, that understanding of what it means to be human is to cultivate, right? Is to produce for the purposes of consumption, I would presume, right? But that is not the ultimate aim or that is not the re reductive, re you can't reduce homo hortulanos to homo consumens, right? And that is, so that's where I would think the, the dialogue can begin and continue is, well, well, how do we parse out all of the differences? And what does this look like then? How do you build a political economy around homo hortulanos? Well, uh, then then I would like to have a question for all presenter or the presenter. Um, they say, unfortunately, some religious constituency identify themselves with agendas of climate change deniers. How could we, from inside the church, can invite them, attract them to environmental protection or remediation? Well, I could I think you know the, the science of climate change is is disputed by not an insignificant amount of people, but uh, I think we could also say it's uh, there's a there's a call here for prudence. We don't have to wait for everybody to be 100% agreed on the science, and we don't have to have the science make uh, you know 100% uh, 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 you know proven arguments about what they're saying. We can look at uh, we can look at uh, we can we can look at what science is telling us and make a prudential uh, judgment. For example, you know there are people that will deny that smoking is bad for their health, right? And there are people that smoke a pack of cigarettes a day and they live to be ninety years old and they have no apparent health consequences. But but even though that person might live to be 95 years old and have no consequences from his smoking, we have enough evidence that smoking is bad for one's health. And therefore, prudentially, society and an individual can make an option to stop smoking. So in the same way, uh, you know, we can, uh, we don't have to, you know, if, uh, we don't have to refute every argument that the climate change deniers might put forth. You know, they're like that person that is 95 year old, years old that smoked two packs of cigarettes a day and have had no bad effect. But we just say, okay, we, we, we hear you, we grant that, but let's look at the, uh, what is the prudent thing to do in this case? And prudence would tell us that it's better to do something rather than nothing. And I think that's, perhaps the, the, the best we can do when uh, dialoguing, if you will, with climate deniers. An argument from prudence. I would just add a little, a little bit there and, and to, to, to say yes. And also we don't, you know, we don't need, we don't need the evidence from climate change to know that we're being destructive to the planet, right? So it's like, you know, um, there's you can see you can see evidence all around us. So even if that that doesn't amount to something huge, it's pretty clear that when you know we're blowing the tops off mountains, that that's probably not caring for creation. And there is always room for prudential decisions to move to do something rather than nothing. Yeah. Yes. Um, I don't know, some 
anybody else would like to to say something about that about the 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 question that came from from the floor um there is another was another question to carlos um to regarding if you can uh, discuss a little more about the the examples that you presented the five examples that you oh, yes the the fifth example was about the mega project of the tren maya which is basically a train going next to a uh, through tropical forest connecting a uh, cancun and the other large center sports tourism to um, all across uh, crossing mayan communities and the challenge there the image there was a uh, uh, community saying we would like a train it would connect us with markets and jobs and whatever but we want to be in control we want to have a say not have all the uh, corporations coming in taking over the land and deciding what's going to be there we want to to take it at our own pace and keep the forest keep the economy great keep the progress at the same time and uh, the discussion those communities was open um, and saying we really don't want to say no or say yes. We want to say yes in a way that we are good stewards of the land because this land is our legacy and we owe it to, 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 to the earth. Well, then we are um, almost at the end of our, I don't know if Presidente Solis would like to, to say something else. We are almost at the end of our, Possibly. Ah, uh, thank you, Maria. Enrique, I would just Enrique would like to say something else. I, I would just like to thank everybody. Uh, but Don Enrique, go ahead, please. Uh, just I wanted to to take uh, a sentence from Laudato Si that says something: men and humanity still has the ability to work together in building our common home. This is very much in the center of my message. I think we have a lot of small things moving on, which are extremely useful because they give us lessons and, 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 and guidance to work. But we need really is to continue deepening the global approaches in the economy and also the regional approaches, something which is missing today. And see, I wish we could have in Latin America, we have so many elements to build, to make contributions to these issues, to agree on some collective things. My impression is that all the messages are extremely useful, must continue, but still we must, as the Laudato Sim says, agree on major things at the global level in order to work together towards what we want. This is something which I want to recall from this, this citation of, of this impressive Laudato Si. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Don Enrique. So I think we can end this panel on that high note. I would like to thank all the participants on behalf of FIU, the Green School, and Black for your being with us today. Uh, we have been inspired. We've learned a lot from your participations, you know, and we know that you've done a tremendous contribution so far. So to all of you, thank you. And I would also like to remind our audience and, and also our panelists that tomorrow we have another feature presentation, Father Augusto Sampini, who is a direct, the Executive Director of the Dicasteri and Economic and Social Development at the Vatican coming in, and a panel with experts on education and other very important issues regarding the environment, ecological, in, integral ecology, and ecological conversion. So please do join us in in that event as well so thank you again have a great rest of the week and uh, thank you for being part of this enormous universal effort to preserve our common home thank you very much thank you thank you thank you for everybody we learn a lot today thank you <laughs>